So we have a great panel today. I'm sure everyone's going to learn a lot and have a lot of fun. Um, I wanted to start off with a, a very sort of fundamental question. The topic of our panel, y'all, is from seed to Facebook. And I wonder if y'all could talk about whether you think at this juncture of Facebook or a company like Uber or any one of these big unicorn companies is the right model for an entrepreneur to pursue or, or an ideal for a company to, for an entrepreneur to go after, or whether there's a better framework that's yet to be discovered or something else out there. People shouldn't compare themselves to Facebook. They should be their own thing. Tracy, do you have some thoughts on that? Well, I, I don't think anyone should really think about I should be get to Facebook and Uber. That's in the venture capital world. It's rare to get even close, even close to that. It's rare to get money. It's rare to even be looked at. So to have that as your beacon, I think, is kind of dangerous, and it can be really hard on an entrepreneur. I think you you come up with your measure of what success is, what makes you first happy, and if you want to be a, be a unicorn, then go for that. But I think you need to start with what can your reality of what your business can really be. Carolina, you have thoughts? Um, well, we are, uh, well, before we were an impact fund, we were opportunistic. So we were actually one of the first seed investors in Uber. Uh, so I don't know if a lot of folks know our fund. We're a social impact fund and our um, bosses, the partnership actually did something that is unprecedented. They wrote, um, an open letter calling out a lot of things that they felt were wrong with the culture in Uber. That is not common. It's kind of unheard of in the venture capital industry. Um, but it, we thought as a fund it was the right thing to do. So um, to your question, I really think it's about um, being thoughtful and intentional about how you as an entrepreneur want to build the culture of a company. So I think a lot of things with Uber, they had this um, concept about uh, toe stepping. So the idea is like you can break these rules and maybe you'll be reprimanded, ask for forgiveness later. I think it got to a point where it was, it, it, was, uh, it created a toxic culture that wasn't inclusive of, of a lot of folks. And we see all these lawsuits coming out. Um, when the open letter went out, um, it also had a positive tone, like here's an opportunity for you to learn and, and change. And I think now, as we've, we're reading in the news, Uber actually came out with a, a seminal uh, policy in that uh, right now, folks who have been harassed or have suffered sexual assault are no longer forced to go into arbitration. At this point, um, they have agency and they can choose to go to arbitration, mediation, or actually take it to an open court of law. Uh, and now Lyft has followed. They also now have put in place um, no longer, if you settle um, through a sexual harassment suit with the with a firm, that you have to sign a, non, a confidentiality agreement. So, um, I think it's important to take right. note that I am hopeful and optimistic that companies can change, but ultimately it really is important for founders to think about um, building a culture that is the one that they want to um, be remembered for. How early does that start, Andy? Like for you, when you thought about how you wanted Wonder to be as a culture and when you were thinking about the kinds of investors you wanted to back the company, what was that, what did that process look like to you and, and how does intentionality at the beginning help one get from, from say, a seed stage company to uh, something that, that may be of the scale of Uber and Facebook, but perhaps better actors in a community? Yeah, I think that, you know, I, I never think about things in terms of how big can it be? You know, maybe at this stage of my career I do, but when I started, you know, this is my fourth company that I started. And I, I started my first one in high school in Argentina at a time where, you know, we didn't have the information or the resources or the tools or the network that, that we do have now or that I have now as well. And for me, it was a combination of opportunity of an idea of this is something that people want and that could be interesting. Not thinking specifics about like how big it can be in terms of revenue or, or size, but there's a lot of people that would love this and it's something I'm passionate about, it's something I'm excited about, right? Because when you're doing something as an entrepreneur, you want to have passion and conviction to be able to really overcome all the barriers that you're going to have, right? So what I learned over the years is, you know, at the beginning it was, okay, how do I, anything that helps me get it, it's fine. Whether it's somebody who wants to work for free or somebody who wants to write any sort of check, somebody who wants to buy some advertising on my website. You know, my, my first company was a music website in Spanish. Like when 
There was no music lessons in Spanish, so anybody that wanted to do anything with us was great, and it was new, and I was learning. Now, with this company, after you know, starting a few different companies, having exits, dealing with all kinds of different investors, now I had a bit of more of the, the experience and the luxury to say, this can be really big, what do I need to get there? How do I get the both strategic investors? It's not about just getting money, but it's how do I, how do I get people who are gonna understand how do I build this product? How do I build our marketing, our brand, our team? How do I get people who are really gonna get the same idea that I'm getting to, to, to do it? And the good news, what's interesting today with, with the resources we have is that those people are out there, right? So you can, you can find people, even though you may not know them, they're on social media, they're online, and so you can find ways to try to reach out to the people that you feel are aligned with the way you think, and that is probably the most valuable resource before money. It, I, I hear what you're saying, but you also have the benefit of being a serial entrepreneur who's done pretty well with some of your other companies, so it, it, you know, it's not like you're knocking on the door for the first time. Tracy, when you think about that entrepreneur who is knocking on the door for the first time, can, is it that easy to just holler at someone on LinkedIn or, or like tweet at them and say, you know, hey, I've got this great idea and our, our message is totally aligned and, you know, I didn't go to Harvard and I didn't go to Stanford and I don't have that background, but I have an amazing idea, you should fund me. Is it that simple or? Well, um, Silicon Valley, Silicon Beach, Silicon whatever, you, whatever it is, um, they say it's a meritocracy, but it really isn't because there are structural and systemic barriers for certain segments to really rise above. So if you're a woman or a person of color, it's not as easy as it sounds to get capital. Capital is the most difficult part of growing a business. And for a lot of people of color and women, they don't have the friends and family to tap into to start your business. That's how a lot of entrepreneurs start your business friends or family, right? So, um, and then the venture, and you go further, you know, angels, that's still a network of predominantly white men that is hard to get into, and you get into venture, seed, and then you get into your series A. A lot of them don't even take um, unsolicited uh, decks, right? So you have to know people. So the meritocracy isn't, it doesn't matter if you've done have all, even if you're from Stanford and Harvard and you still don't know those people, it's hard to get in. So I think it's a different route for um, women and people of color, especially when you look at the percentages over the last 17 years that have not changed at all for women. And Carolina, you were an entrepreneur um, knocking on these doors and you did come from an Ivy League background, right? So what was your experience like when you were raising money for your first one? Um, I think a lot of it was also my mindset, right? I think there obviously are systemic issues, um, but there's also language that you may not know about um, or how to kind of present yourself. There are a lot of things that I did wrong, so I'll, I'll, I'll definitely, uh, I think part of my job now is telling people what not to do because I literally did everything um, that you are not supposed to do. Um, but I think when I first went into pitching, my mindset was that these folks had some type of power over me that I didn't have a superpower. And I think once I changed that mindset that I also had value or value to give to this investor, like I knew a sector better than they did that they may have been investing in, then my mindset actually shifted to what Andy was talking about, reaching out uh, and connecting with people on Twitter and developing uh, relationships online, which then I took offline. Um, but I will tell you, uh, I remember going to a demo day at, at a, well, I was just going to name the company. I will not name just them. Just throw it out. Do it. Name may, names. May, may have two O's in it. <laughs> um, Does it rhyme with schmoogle? <laughs> So yes, yeah. um, walking into a demo day there, someone handed me a plate. So let's think about that. The way I look, they handed me a plate. They assumed oh. that I was a caterer, that I cleaned there, and that is a reality. And for us not to, to say that that doesn't exist, um, would I, I would be disingenuous. Yeah. Your mindset can't change the way you look yeah. on the outside. Exactly, it can't <laughs> but, change. Yeah, no, for sure. But but so like with that in mind, Andy, how does how did how did you go about changing your mindset to say like I have value and people need to think about me because really the venture relationship actually depends on putting capital to work and good entrepreneurs who will make them money. They don't have any sort of like 
benefit to people unless they are choosing good entrepreneurs who have good returns. So how do you convince a VC well, and, that you're the guy to back? And I agree with what both of you said. I think the way, and I've learned this also by, by trying and learning and, 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 you know, no matter how good your idea is or how connected you are, you're going to have a lot of rejection. I get 90% of the people I talk to about what we're doing now rejected us and some of them don't, right? And it, it always gonna, it's always going to happen no matter how big you are. Um, you know, and I think that the, the mindset that you have to do, right, if you, if you tweet somebody and you're like, hey, can you invest in my company or here's my deck or something, no matter who you are, they're gonna, probably going to reject you because they'll be like, okay, you're kind of a little desperate or there's no context, right? The way that I've approached things in my life and the way that I see people approach me now because I, you know, when people approach me about something, it's a little different, right? And it's this idea of, you know, first of all, it's what we're doing now with our company, which is we try to find people that have context with what we're doing, right? Somebody who, like, we're working on stuff around gaming or entertainment. So it's, like, people who I already know they care about what we're doing. It's not somebody who's, like, completely, you know, in another subject. Who's call, not yeah. Gonna get, yeah, so I talk to somebody who I know cares about this. And I say, hey, we're working on something cool. I would love to show it to you. I want to see what you think. I would love your advice. I'm, I'm a fan. Whatever it is that gets me to that person to be perceptive, if it's on Twitter... I may not even reach out directly. I may look at, you know, if they're tweeting about something in that subject, I may reply and be like, oh, yeah, this is what I think about it. And you try to find an organic way to get in as opposed to, you know, I want money, right? Because every time that I, <laughs> that I went and, and I, you know, and it happened to me when I started this new company, we, you know, I didn't know what we were doing exactly. Um, and we were trying to figure out, we had some ideas. And I started reaching out to people. And I reached out to people I'll give you an example. I went and speaking of far and culture and somebody who didn't know who I was and didn't care about my background, I ended up finding a way to meet with the founder of Sega. For anybody who's gaming, <laughs> founder of Sega. This 80-something-year-old Japanese guy. So I was in Japan and I found somebody who was able to get me in a room with this guy. And I went and he had his translator and he was there and he had no idea why I was there. But he, he, understood, he understood what I was trying to do, understood my passion, understood that we had things in common, and I was a fan. Like, my 13-year-old my self would have ever, ever dreamed to be in that room with that guy. But I went there just because I wanted to meet him, and he, I left with an investment from him mm -hmm. without really wanting that, right? And it's, and it's because he got where, what I was. And so that, I think that's the biggest thing, is to try to find that common ground and something that gets you in. Um. That really resonates with me because I often think people think of us as, like myself, as a piggy bank. Um, and when people are seeking venture capital, it's actually to accelerate the growth of the business, not necessarily to start the business. Um, so one thing that I took away from what Andy said is not to be transactional, but actually to build, regardless of like what you may look like, your background, people have things in common. So make sure that you build relationships with people. And that is like when that kind of mindset, when I got to that, um, doors were opening much more easily. I'm not going to say by any way that they still weren't difficult, but that level of changing my mindset and reframing how I saw the relationship between investor and entrepreneur was really important for me. And, and People should realize that investors are people too. Like yeah. we have emotions, we have things we care about, and we are really investing in the people almost before the idea. So you can have, as you will hear from any other investor, you could have an A idea and be a C team, and we won't invest in you. But if you're an A team with a B minus B <laughs> idea, then they're more likely to invest in you because it's it's more about the person and what they're gonna what they're gonna be able to do with that company. Well, and y'all all invest pretty early, Andy. You're a seed stage investor as well, so I'm gonna give y'all all his email address after, and you can hit him up for no. I'm, I'm I don't invest early. Uh, 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 <laughs> we, no, but, we does. but 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 for for if if you are our first time entrepreneur, you don't have a track record, and you're coming from one of these. Um, non-traditional, let's call them backgrounds, right? Which is, which is really like most of the people in the world because that, that most of the capital that Silicon Valley allocates and other Silicon named places allocate, they're allocating to people who come from Ivy League schools or private schools or whatever. Um, if you don't have that, what can you, what do you as investors look for to make that, that, that classification of, oh, this is a good team? If they don't have like an imprimatur from Stanford, if they haven't necessarily been, you know, um, been a Google employee or Schmoogle employee or whatever, um, like how does that work? And Andy, if you want to take that, and then we'll move to later stage stuff too. I mean, I, I think again, I think it's you try to find 
some way to demonstrate to the persons, who, the people you want to talk to, that you're smart, that you know what you're talking about, that you have something of value to give, right? And find some way of, of having that connection. And, you know, and then, and then once you are able to prove yourself, then you're, you know, because what I say to people now, so, you know, I had terrible grades, I dropped out of school, like I wasn't, I, that was never my thing. And I, and I remember my second company, when I partnered with some kids that had graduated from Harvard Business School, like they had the world, you know, any, it was the first time I went to Silicon Valley was when I had them, because we could get meetings with anybody and I couldn't get those meetings before and I had able to still build a company and sell it before that on my own, right? And, and, and that was because it was, I was not really worried about those things, I was more worried about, okay, this is what I'm trying to accomplish who are the people that can do this and how do I find a way? And I got, like I said, I got rejected. I got kicked out of offices and people were like, you know, get out of here. Like, you're, you're. I had, and I was 18, right? Like I went through a lot of that stuff, but it only takes one or two people that right. will willing to listen, right? So yeah. I think it's, you have to, you have to be confident. You have to not be afraid right. and you have to try to find that common ground. Now, there are other sources of capital than these traditional um, VCs that I've been talking about. And Tracy, you're trying to raise like a $100 million fund to be an alternative to this sort of way of doing things, which is amazing. I think y'all should all like, like, let's give you a round of applause for that. It's amazing. And I think people, people are afraid to ask for the amount of money that people actually need to make those kinds of funds work. And, and with Kapoor Capital as well, like y'all are, y'all are creating an alternative to this ecosystem that has existed for a long time. Now, um, what do you want to see in an entrepreneur coming to you uh, that shows that they're prepared, that they are part of that, that A team that can make a business work? What, do you, what, are, what are your criterion? Revenue? Well, like, is yeah, it that simple? Or? There, there are standard, simple things we, we want to see. Um, I, I, so I'm also an executive in residence at the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator, so I see really early companies. And it, it doesn't matter what gender, color, race, ethnicity you are, people have really shitty financials. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that, but I really, if I could just see people prepare their financials, right. meaning projections that show where business is going to go, I would be really happy. I mean, right there is where I, and even our companies that are working and they are growing and they have revenues, we still have to redo their financials. So I think knowing how big your market is, having projections, and for the women in the audience, think bigger. Um, I have a, a friend who's an investor up in Silicon Valley, and she says when women come in, come in, she doubles their projections. And when men comes in, she cuts them in half. <laughs> <laughs> because the women always underestimate what they really, they go for what they need instead of what you want. And men are like, ah, I want the world, right? So um, I'm going to just sit, start with me is financials are really important to me that I see where you're w going. And a lot of it isn't for real. People are just guessing pretty much. But I want to know that you know you have to go someplace to get a certain amount of money. Right. Yeah. And what a, what about for y'all? What, what is it? I've, I've got one more question to wrap up because we're, we've got it. We're I'll go tight quick. on time. But. Um, so for us, it's really about like hustle and grit. Um, I always want to back in what have they done in their past life? I don't necessarily care if it's in the particular sector, although that is ideal, but what shows me that they can crush through ceilings and that they can execute. So that I'm always kind of looking for that. Uh, in terms of projections, because we're early, for me, it's really what are the underlying assumptions? Because I always assume that the numbers are going to be wrong. And one last thing that I will, I think is really important, not every business that has tech, tech enabled or software necessarily is venture backable. Venture backable companies have a certain type of criteria to them. They have to be in big markets, like in the multi-billion dollar market opportunities, um, and they have to uh, get us liquidity in a short time frame, which is typically seven to nine years. So not every business is set up for that, um, but if you can build a good business and print paper, do it. For me, it's 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 one, the the passion and commitment of the entrepreneur, right. um, the knowledge on the subject. You know, I think that these days, the knowledge is in, in the internet. You can find anything, and you can educate, and you can become an expert of anything you want without going to college. So, if you really care about something and you want to solve a problem, you gotta go prepare and you gotta know. Yeah. And those are the things that I care about the most when when somebody talks to me about. All right, I, we're gonna get the hook, but I have one last question for you. It's uh, it's a yes or no one, so it's very easy. Uh, crowdfunding or ICOs, cryptocurrency, should anyone go for crypto? 
Is ICO a way forward? Yes or no? No. Uh, yes, if regulated. It, maybe, it depends. Maybe. It depends. It depends. It depends. No. It depends. All right. And, and on that note, I'm afraid we have to go. Thank you all so much for Thank paying you guys. and listening to us. Thank it's you, John. Great.